signals out, it kind of changes how the whole system works. So if you take out a crested gecko, you're going to have a lot more insects, um, in which case you're going to have a lot less things like nectar and pollen because a lot of those flowers are getting eaten. Um, if you take out too many of them, right, you'll have not, no, nothing to eat those insects and they're going to start eating the nectar all the flowers, the trees, and you can actually wipe out an entire ecosystem. Um, so it is kind of neat. We talk, like I said, we also talk about like the color changes and stuff, which is kind of fun. Um, one of my favorite little visits, I'll send Angela around with them. Right? <laughs> so, I can get through some more critters, but um, and as I said, I like to touch stuff, so it just came from me being a strange little kid. Um, so the next ones I want to do and I'll start easy. I know most of you guys in here are actually okay with snakes and stuff, but we do have some little guys. So I always start off with a very simple snake. Um, this guy's a corn snake. All right, very, very common pet snake. Now I always talk about kids are a lot of times afraid that a snake's going to eat them, or a snake is poisonous. Now those are the two big things I get from kids. Now I like to use a corn snake, not because it's a cool little corn snake that's really friendly. That too, but also corn snakes are kind of neat. They have a very small head, right? So it's easy to kind of show kids. So a snake that has a small head, guys, right? The little guys here. Does he have very big teeth? No. Does he have huge fangs in there? Not really, right? In fact, most things like a corn snake or a garter snake, their teeth are actually shaped in about the size of a splinter. All right, they're very small. So. They're an easy snake to kind of ease kids into. We should see that they're friendly, they're colorful, right? And they're definitely not poisonous. They're actually really helpful. They'll eat things like the insects and stuff when they're really young. And then they kind of move on to eating things like mice and rats and lizards um, throughout their habitat. So they are, are kind of cool. Um, they kind of, as they get bigger with any animal, they start to eat more. The other thing I like to talk about is with size, snakes usually change their temperaments or their way of hunting. So the little guys, like the little kids, have a lot of energy. They can run around. They have to eat a lot of snacks because they have a high metabolism, right? They're eating all kinds of different things. As we get older, we get bigger, we get lazier. I'm sorry, guys, we do, right? We want to sit down, have some coffee, watch a football game, right? Maybe have a beer, right? That's how it is. I'm sorry, guys, right? But in the animal world, it's very similar. Uh, the little animals are usually kind of quick, so when we see a garter snake, slither out of the bushes, right, and it's fast, and it might look kind of scary. It's not necessarily chasing us, it's actually usually just trying to find the easiest way to get out, which is the same way you're going, all right, it's the simplest way to get away. So we see a lot of that, and a lot of times we get afraid of the little guys. Um, I do have some bigger ones to show you that are a little bit more fun. Um, so the first one is a Burmese python, I like to use that guy. Um, a little bit of a strange setup here, guys. Alright. Get a little guy. Alright. So, we have a Burmese python. This guy, alright, is a, an albino Burmese python. Now, Burmese pythons are a pretty common animal in, like, the educa it is an educational tool. Um, they do get fairly large. They can reach up to about 16 feet long. Um, they're eating good. So, they are kind of neat. Um, I like to talk about the albino Burmese python. Um, I usually would bring a, a, a normal colored one as well, but didn't do that today with slacking. All right, so um, we got color variation. So, in here we all, or most of you guys know what a Burmese python looks like. So. In the wild, the Burmese python is going to be a brown color, kind of dark. uses that to help blend in and camouflage into its environment. Um, and in captivity, we get things like the albino snakes, and we get some of the other funny colored stuff. I do that with ball pythons too. All right, But that's a normal color. So in the wild, the yellow ones wouldn't survive so well because they stick out and they get eaten pretty quick. But just like humans, we come in a lot of different colors, um, sizes, shapes, right? And their scale color or their skin tone is a lot like our hair color, right? So we have people that are brunettes or blondes or we have red-headed people, right? We look black here and it comes in a variety of different colors. Now, those colors are a lot like a snake's color. So they happen, right? it's just a normal part of life. And just like people, we come in different colors and sizes and shapes. And it's, even though it's a different color, or it might look a lot different, 
they're still the same animal. They live in the same areas, and they do the same things. Um, these guys are, are kind of neat. I like to also talk about one of my favorite things with these guys. Is I do talk about some of the stuff like shedding. Um, it's an easy snake, it's kind of slow. So we talk about shedding with them. Shedding is a, like when they grow, when they, their skin kind of peels off. Um, so as they shed or they molt their skin, we also do that. We don't think a lot about it, but we shed. Um, our skin comes off in little tiny pieces because we have tiny little skin cells. All right, it doesn't stick together so well. But we also shed, I know I was talking about how girls might notice this a little bit more. When we brush your hair, girls, right? They kind of sticks to your hairbrush, right? That's our form of shedding. All right, we don't have a scaly skin like the snake does, so it doesn't come off in one big piece. Um, the other thing that's really neat is snakes have no eyelids. So a lot of people think they're creepy because they don't blink. Um, and the reason for them not blinking is because they don't have eyelids. So they have a scale that protects their eye. In fact, I can have to rub my hand over it. doesn't bother them. Um, it's protected. And that's for when he's eating. Um, not only does his eyes stay open and pay attention to what's going on, but it also enables him to kind of rub his head down, push it in the dirt, all right, and it's not going to hurt his eyes. So it is kind of a neat little thing. We talked a little bit about he's got little heat pits on his nose. Um, helps him to sense heat so he can see even when it's pitch black or um, even if he had no eyes, he could still kind of do a little bit of hunting. <coughs> we see that with ones in captivity a little bit. Not so much with the wild ones. All right, but we'll bring him around. He, he's kind of a fun one for the kids to touch. All right. We'll send, yeah, we'll send Angela around with him. We got him around with him. <laughs> we'll just pile him on her. All right, Angela's a good sport. So the next one I have is actually a little bit bigger. All right. So actually, yeah, Sean here to help, help me. Don't usually bring this guy out, um, only because he weighs a lot. So, Sean, I'm going to have you steal him with me. All right, this guy is another snake. It's actually a reticulated python. And it's, uh, they're one of the largest snakes in the world, um, or longest snake in the world, I suppose. Right? So, this one's actually in a shed today, and uh, he also has a little, uh, got like a He's a wood chip stuck in his mouth, though. Yeah, that's why I don't like aspen, guys. I used it for a little while, and now I don't like it. So, <laughs> um, so we'll take him out um, and slide him up there. All right. He's a, a big one. All right. Like we said, there's a reason I don't use this one. It's an awful heavy snake. All right. So I do like to talk about big snakes, right? So. Yeah, like I said, it's a shed kind of good today, guys. All right, but snakes like this, like a retech, right? A, a fairly large snake. Right? We look at them, and we think of something that's going to eat us, right? And in reality, right, when we think about someone like a little kid or a small child, maybe, right? But if you look at the shape of a human, right? Snakes are usually eating things in the wild. The retake would eat things like monkeys. Um, they'd eat a lot of birds, and, and as well as uh, other small mammals, uh, <laughs> even things as small like small pigs and stuff like that. But they're not really eating things like people. So we look at a snake, right? And he's not hanging out on Sean right now. But when he's slithering around down on the ground, right? The reason they're not going to look at us as a, a food source is because we're a tall animal. So walking around, right, makes us really tall. So when a snake like this guy slithers, slithers around down on the ground, it's only about six inches tall. So when we walk up to it, even though it might look really big and a little bit scary, it's actually thinking that we're really big. Um, so it's a little bit different. That's why typically we don't see things like a big snake that would want to eat us. Um, the other thing I really like to talk about, we've talked a little bit about getting eaten by a snake. I always hear that snakes like size you up, right? And like lay in bed next to you, see if they're going to swallow you down. It doesn't happen, guys. In fact, snakes don't think like that, all right? It doesn't think much at all, all right? I'm sorry, guys, it doesn't, right? And uh, you guys might hate me for saying that, but it really doesn't. All right, so it doesn't know you, it doesn't know your, your friends, like it doesn't do that, all right? Might recognize some sense or something like that, but who knows, all right? Um, they definitely don't lay in bed and try to size you up. Um, they don't have that forward thinking. We talked a little bit about like the reptilian brain and how that functions. It's a very basic thinking, so he's thinking about getting food, getting water, staying warm, all right? And 
that's pretty much it. So he doesn't really size people up or do anything like that. Um, so it is kind of, kind of a neat thing. Now, the thing that I like to talk about, like I bring out something like this and you guys see it, right? And I like the educational part of this. So to me, this guy's really cool and you guys probably appreciate it. But in all reality, you don't need something like this to educate people. Um, it's a really big animal, really cool, kind of fun, right? But something like a Burmese python, I can talk about the same thing. So you'll notice like, when I do out and I do an educational program, I might bring something like a corn snake or a Burmese python, and something relatively small. Um, and a lot of people are like, oh, do you have like, a really big one? Like, yeah, I can bring up really big ones. And I, I've done that for like, like a college or something like that. But in reality, you're going to learn just as much from a little corn snake or a ball python that you can learn from a big guy like this, right? Yeah, he's got like a, there's a little more big guys, right? He's got a, I'm making it like weird, if he sounds, right? He's got a, he's got a little, um, he's an aspen that's stuck in his jaw, so that's uh, always fun. So he plucked it out. Uh, we won't bring him around, I don't want him to get sick from anyone, but uh, they, uh, yeah, I know, he was actually at Dr. Martin's oh, okay. this past week, so yeah, I was actually right down here. So they are really neat animals, um, but we don't need to have a really big animal. We don't have to have something that's super impressive to talk or educate people. Um, most of you guys in this room probably own some kind of a reptile, and most of the points that I'm making, like with a snake or with a lizard, you can make with a leopard gecko or a corn snake. And you can take that animal out, you can talk to people about it. Um, if you have, even like, we don't think about it, but you have grandkids that come over, you have cousins that come over, and they might not know about it. You live in the house where it's just a snake, you tell them it's a snake, right? But if we talk a little bit more about it, right? <laughs> He's nice and warm still, so. The, um, so we'll talk a little bit about that kind of stuff. And we can learn, uh, yeah, right? There, right? We can learn just as much from a little corn snake or from a leopard gecko as we can learn from something big like that. Um, and a big part of that, to me, like I said, is that connection to the animal. So when we bring out an animal like a corn snake, right? It's friendly. It's small. It's easy to walk around with you guys, and you can touch it. Now, little kids like the kid that I encountered <laughs> at a school not that long ago. He might be afraid of that. Um, and education isn't something that we're going to try to impress someone or put on a demonstration, a show for someone. It's to make them learn in reality. And you want to use animals that are conducive to learning, um, which I'm a big advocate for. Um, I, I don't think it's wise for me to bring a, like a close 20 foot long snake to a birthday party. Not, not some of our guys, right? Um, it's not kind of something I'd bring out to a preschool. It's just not an animal for that. Um, bring something like a corn snake where those kids find that that snake slithers, it, it crawls, and very basic information like that is really all they need at that level. Um, if they see that that snake slithers around and it's not hurting them at three years old, 10 years later when they're 13 years old, they still might remember that little slithery snake that never hurt them and didn't scare them. Um, if I brought something like this guy out and those kids got scared of the snake, then forever they're going to remember that they got afraid of a snake. And that's something that I don't think a lot of people really think much about. Um, sometimes, depending on the audience, there's appropriate animals for education. And we might think that all animals are great for education. They're not guys. All right? And some of them we might scare someone with, we might, it might be fun, like the snappy turtle's fun, but he can be scared, right? So there's a lot of ways that we have to talk to people and use our knowledge to kind of go around superstitions or like kind of like folklore that's kind of built up around some of these animals that we might not really think too much about um, and might kind of scare some people. So. One of the other ones that's kind of fun, uh, we'll talk about this guy. I don't know where I'm at on time. This is definitely a different show than I usually do, guys. So, kind of fun and too for you guys, right? So, I'm going to cut this guy, right? So, this guy is a rhinoceros iguana, right? And rhinoceros iguanas are really a pretty neat iguana. Usually, when we think about iguanas, right? Kind of hang out, yeah, he's pretty, pretty relaxed, shedding too, right? But, 
when we think about iguanas, we usually think about a big green guy hanging out up in the tree. Um, most of the iguana species live pretty much on the ground. Um, we had a lot of rock iguanas and stuff like that that hang out pretty low to the ground or on little ledges and crevices. This guy is a rhinoceros iguana. They're predominantly found in Haiti. And it's one of the cool things I like to talk about. So we see this guy, right? And we, he looks really cool. We get to touch him, feel him, right? Um, in the wild, there aren't very many rhinoceros iguanas in a lot of rock iguanas left. Um, they're hunted, they're eaten, um, they're also not seen as a really impressive animal. Um, and it's really important to me, and I really like the rhinoceros iguana. Um, there are a lot of foundations that we talk about that raise money and do stuff like that. Now, it's not so much protecting the individual rhinoceros iguana that helps us. So in colleges, I like to, or even high schools again, I like to talk a little bit about some of the other things that we have to protect. So we always talk about like protecting the environment, keeping it safe and clean and all that kind of stuff. We don't think about things like the plants that grow in the environment and how like a species of grass might actually save a species of iguana, which in return saves some other species. So a rhinoceros iguana is one of those species I like to talk about. Um, in Haiti, they've actually done habitat recreation. Instead of focusing so much on breeding the animals and reintroducing them into the wild, they talk about things like grass and trees. All right, And by learning a little bit more about those trees and the plants that grow in the environments, um, they've actually been able to successfully start repopulating islands with these guys because they have the food sources and they have the requirements that are needed for them. Um, I also like to talk about, we think about like our life as a really good life and we go outside, we might see squirrels and stuff running around, we see them everywhere, but things like Haiti, they have bigger problems to worry about, all right? We don't always think about that when we talk about habitat reconstruction and saving species, so we talk about things like India and like they have tigers and stuff that are endangered and oh, we should send money to save the tigers. In reality, those tigers are being hunted because they're a source of money. Um, one of my big things is I love zoos. Can't say enough good about them. Um, we learn about species, things like the tiger, or we learn about things like a rhinoceros iguana. In fact, the first one I ever saw was actually at like a like Wild Kingdom in Disney. They had a, a rhinoceros iguana, fell in love with the thing. All right, so they are a really neat species, and it's something that you see in a zoo. You might see it as a real thing. Um, you're not going to see it as a book or a character on a TV show. So it puts a, like a living animal with it. Um, but the other things that zoos do, and a lot of these programs do, is they teach you a little bit about the lifestyle of where these animals come from. So in India, right, we think about things like tigers and elephants and all these really cool animals. But in reality, life isn't that great there. So in order to help the animals, I think it's also really important to help people in the environments, um, supplying things like clean waters and clean, clean like living conditions. Um, and that is just as beneficial to helping these animals as reaching out and giving a thousand dollars to the tiger. Um, because by helping the people that live in those areas, you're actually helping to protect the animals that are living there because they don't need to use them as a food source. They don't need to use them as a, a resource, um, as many of those people see them as. Um, I also really like to talk about things like the rhinoceros iguana. Um, for a long time, they were hunted and eaten. Um, they've now, because they've educated people and done research, like projects with the people of Haiti, um, they've learned that using something like a rhinoceros iguana as a tool uh, versus a food source is more valuable. So they can see that they can bring people out and they do like iguana tours. So you can go out and you can see iguanas living out in the wild. And people will learn from that. And at the same time, those people that are doing those tours that used to be hunting iguanas are now protecting them and keeping them safe. Um, I'll bring this guy around. He's super friendly. He likes to be, likes to be passed. So. Right. Like I said, I had him, had him for a little while now. Uh, super friendly. He'll hang out with you. But he definitely squirms around a little bit. He doesn't stick to my hands all that good. So. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Is really cool. In the wild, they eat predominantly different grasses, uh, leaves on lower lower branches. 
Um, they're also eating seeds and nuts as well that a lot of people don't think they eat, but they do. Uh, they eat some some small animals, um, eggs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's almost always shedding. Why can't they? Why can't they? Yeah, it's got strong little fuzz. <laughs> Yeah, good. Yeah. You want to try? You were the smart one. You brought the gloves, right? I see why he's called the Ray He's got like that horn on his head, right, guys? Yeah, and he also has part gray on. He is kind of gray, right? Kind of looks like a rhino, right? How old would this, would this So this one is about five, somewhere around there. Um, they can live for quite a long time. They can live to be somewhere around 60 to 70 years, supposedly. Um, they, are, they are really neat species. And like all reptiles, guys, they grow their entire life. So they still will get bigger a little bit. Yeah, he clings pretty, pretty well. <laughs> I didn't wear the right sweater. Yeah, right? Um, It'll wait for him. Or a lot of these guys, right? <laughs> yeah, right? These guys, so... I know I, I just tell you about how the animals, like the reptiles aren't always thinking all that much. Um, so the rhinoceros iguanas, as well as some reptiles like your monitor lizards, um, even some of the crocodilians, they do have a little bit more functionality. Um, this guy does target training so he knows different colors, um, which is kind of cool. So he'll come and chase a little stick and stuff around. Um, it's still a food based thing. So he learns that and we might see that with like things like alligators or crocodiles, you see them they'll come to a, like a stick or they'll come to a, a trainer. Um, and a lot of that is based on what the trainer's wearing, colors that they wear. Um, we don't think a lot about it, but even things like Petco, I don't know, like the big pet shops, right? Back in the day, they used to have like these bright blue shirts, and I, I know probably half of you guys remember that, right? But um, they had bright blue shirts, and the reason that they put blue shirts on was because dogs are attracted to the color blue. Um, same reason you put blue dog toys everywhere, right? They like blue better. So what it is, is it's to bring those animals to you. Um, and you gotta use like that psychological kind of stuff too. So I use a lot of like, um, like bright colors in their ha habitats. I wouldn't do like bright colors. I always talk about it, you see like bright decor and stuff like that. Um, I don't use a lot of the, like, I think that stuff's kind of crazy. Um, it doesn't look like something that you find out in the wild, so they probably don't like it. But it is important. I also talk about that because they eat bright colored things. So we go to like Dairy Queen, you get one of those like red spoons, you throw it on the ground, right? Or you throw like a straw wrapper on the ground. Those things that are bright colors like that are really attractive to an animal to eat. So he eats things like fruits and stuff in the wild, flowers, hibiscus. So he's eating things that are bright colors in the wild. So some kind of bright colored item on the floor looks like a tasty snack to this guy. Um, and he definitely will try to eat it. So. It is kind of a, a fun little guy, it's, and it's one of those things. So I've done it before, where you bring out like you can bring out like fruits, and you can put like fruits and stuff out, and you'll run over and you'll eat them. But you can also put something like a piece of like plastic, like a square <laughs> piece of plastic, and he'll go over and he'll pick that up and he'll try to eat it, even though it's like a frisbee. All right, it's just something colorful that he might like to eat. All right, so it is kind of a, a neat way to see that. All right, I'll stick this guy in there. <laughs> the next one I want to show you. This one's a, com a common animal in education. I brought out a bigger one today. Probably not much fun to that, but. Alright. So, this guy. Alright. Wiggly guy, alright. So, this guy is an American alligator. He's clearly still got a lot of energy going on, right? So, alligators are really neat. They're part of the crocodilian family. Um, they've been around for millions of years. Ah, right? We know of them as kind of like a, being extra, extra crazy today. 
But we, again, we usually leave the big guys at home. All right, so this one is about six years old, all right, seven years old. And he actually came from another person that did programs like this and ended up moving out of the state, all right? So he's been doing this for a very long time. But as I said, as he gets bigger, he stays home. Um, you can see he's kind of cool for us to see. Most of us are adults in here, all right? But for little guys at a show, he's not so conducive. Um, I think something like a smaller, smaller, younger one is good. Um, but we learn a lot of things from these guys. They do live in I many habitats. We all know they kind of live in swampy places in Florida, right? <laughs> they, they actually live in about a fifth of the United States. And some of the kind of cool things that we don't really think about um, are some of the effects that we have on some of those. <coughs> so right now, we have a little bit of a problem going on with alligators. So a lot of people don't really talk about it or think much about it, but we have things like birth control, all right? Pills that we take, right? Or medicines, right? And we always, you might see like commercials or hear things like get flyers from the town, right? They have a medicine drive where you can bring your medicine to them, right? Some people do things like flush your medicine down the toilet, right? So when people do something like that, right? We don't think much about it. We flush it down the toilet, it's gone, right? But that medicine, even though it might fix you or help you, can make other animals really sick, all right? In fact, alligators, all right, in different parts of Florida are now turning the girls into boys, all right? And the boys into girls and messing them up a little bit. And what's happening is things like our medicines that get flushed down the toilets affect reptiles. And just like us, they, they might help fix us, right? Or we might take them while the doctor tells us to, but you probably shouldn't be taking medicines when you're not sick, right guys? Or we talk about it like when you're having a baby, right? Babies can't take certain things. Alligators and reptiles develop in an egg. That egg, right, sits down in the dirt, right, and it gets affected by the environment that's around it. So things like wet soil that's filled with things like birth control um, are actually changing eggs in, from boy crocodile, alligators and crocodiles into girls. So right now, um, and a really neat thing that's going on at the University of Florida, um, but South Florida, whatever it is. But it's really a kind of a neat new thing that they're talking about and kind of monitoring. Um, it's another way that we don't think a lot about what we flushed in the toilet. We think it goes into the sewerage or the septic. And even though we're just getting rid of it um, and it's flushed in the toilet or it's gone, or we throw it in the trash and it just goes away with the trash guy, um, we have to think about that. There's reasons why towns do things like medicine drops or there's reasons that towns do things like electronics or batteries. Put a battery outside in your shed and it starts to leak, right? It goes into the ground. Those assets can stay in that ground for a very long time. Same with gasoline. We might be running our gas lawnmower outside and it's leaking and it leaks all over the ground, right? Or whatever, it went into the dirt. But that stays there for a very long time. So it is really important to learn about some of those things that affect other animals more so that we can use as like an indicator to see how well an environment's doing. All right, he seems to have calmed down. We'll bring him around, guys. Um, he is usually pretty friendly. All right, like I said, we don't usually bring this guy out. He's a, bit, a little bit too wiggly for us, but he likes to hang out at home better. But <laughs> they are really neat. You'll notice he's got a a little, a little slip behind his eye. That's actually his ear. Um, there he is. Can actually you know opening clothes as they go underwater, which is kind of cool, um, as well as their little nostrils there on the tip of their nose. Their eyes are designed, they're on the top of their head, they kind of work like a periscope, they poke up out of the water so you can kind of see what's going on and stay underwater. They're an ambush predator, so they'll hide underneath the water and wait for something to come along. Um, but, yeah. That's strange. I can't see it being very good for me. <laughs> you want to try? No. Right. That's okay. You want to feel a tail? Right. 
So, short slap. Let me miss this little guy. I love you, loves guys. You gonna try? No. But they are really cool. So some of the other things I talked a little bit about alligators. Um, we'll notice it looks like these little spots on his chin, uh, his nose, right? Um, it's been proven that those actually sense a little bit of electronics um, that every animal, a living animal, puts out. Um, so they can kind of feel their food, um, even in cases where they can't so much see it. Um, we like to talk about things like vacations. Um, so for me, I go on vacation primarily so I can see weird animals. Um, most of us don't do that. And we go on vacation because we want to go to somewhere warm and tropical. Now, those warm tropical places we like go, Florida, the Cayman Islands, Mexico, right? We have animals that might not be the safest to be around or to get close to. And I always talk about, for kids especially, um, we might go down to somewhere, say like Disney World, Florida, right? And you go to go to a beach. Now, it's important because a lot of times you might read signs and they may not have signs up. Um, but you might go to a beach and you see people that are hanging out on the beach, right, sitting there, but no one's swimming, right? In general, it's important, guys, to kind of watch your environment, see what's going on around there, right? If a whole bunch of people are running from one area, you should probably <laughs> run that way too, right? But if you go to a beach, right, or you go to a forest, right, and everyone's standing on a trail, right? Should you walk the trail? Probably not, right? You should stay there, right? If you go to a beach and there's nobody swimming in the water, but there's people at the beach, should you go in the water? Probably not, right? So it's important, guys, to kind of follow what, and see what other people are doing to learn about new environments. Um, it's also really important, obviously, to read signs. If you go to the beach and they have a sign that says no swimming, there's probably a reason they put that up, right? Um, you shouldn't go in the water. If you go to a uh, park and there's a thing that says stay on the trail, there's probably a reason to stay on the trail. Whether that's to protect some, some species or if that's to protect you, um, you always have to make sure you read those signs and rules before you walk in. Um, don't just walk by them and forget about them. Um, so it is really important, and like I always say, especially in tropical places, guys, pay attention to what's going on, people around you. Um, yeah. Make sure it's safe. All right, so we'll stick him back in there. Um, open any questions if anyone wants to ask questions, like whether personal or about the animals. So, um, so the other thing I also, guys, so I always, personally, um, always kind of wondered why we tape up alligators and stuff. And I got thinking about it. Like, so my insurance covers it. When you guys get bitten and you lose your hand, that's that's on me. All right. But one of the things I don't think about, I never really did think about. So we taped those up, um, and something that I never I never really liked doing it. But it's a really good idea. It's a state it law. It actually too. protects him. It's a state law. And mm -hmm. one of the big things, if I was driving home and I got in a car accident, guys, and that animal was out on the road. And the police come up, the police don't know how to deal with an alligator. Um, so something like that is going to protect them from the animal. So it's really made for protecting the, the public. And when we say the public, it's not so much the people that are sitting in this room. It's everyone. Um, and I say that with pets at home, too. Um, I know a lot of people have, like, farmy kind of pets, like pigs, chickens, whatever they have at home. Um, and I always like to talk about that, too. Even your pets, like a cat or a dog. We have laws like a leash law, um, and it's really important to follow those kind of things because if we just let our dogs run around outside, it's not just your dog might be friendly, but maybe that dog on a leash isn't friendly and your dog runs over to it. Um, or, I, not a law, but I really encourage people to keep their cats indoors, right? Um, we have predators, we have things that might get eaten by your cat. So it's really important to kind of keep your pets safe and keep other animals safe from your pets, just like the reason we put tape on him is to protect everyone and not just the people that are right in front of him, but things that we might not see down the road. All right, guys, so feel free to ask any questions. Uh, take things out if you guys want to touch them, hold them, whatever. 
So we'll be here. Um, thank you so much.